I'm Paul Hackwood, Executive Director of the Church Urban Fund, and I have with me Adam Taylor from the Sojourners Movement in the US and internationally. And uh, a warm welcome to the UK and to the work that we're going you know, to hopefully do together. It's very good to have you with us today. We're really looking forward to the day's events and um, just thought we might ask a few questions about the work that you do sure. and how that, uh, how that fits into some of the things that we're doing, really. So, would you tell us a little bit about Sojourners and what you're seeking to do? Yeah, it's really cool. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. So Sojourners is a movement of Christians in the U.S. but also connected to Christians around the world that are deeply committed to putting their faith in an action for social justice. We have been working for almost 50 years on issues of peace, justice, environmental stewardship, and very much want to connect spiritual renewal with social justice, believing that they're intimately connected. We have a magazine that many people know about. We also have a digital publication that you can receive online through at sojo.net. But we've always seen our mission as helping Christians put their faith into action. So we've done a lot of advocacy and mobilizing in the United States around a whole range of social justice issues. And I'll be talking a little bit more about a coalition that we helped co-found called the Circle of Protection back in 2010 that basically came together in response to the budget debate that was happening in Congress and the administration at that time where there were proposals to make pretty draconian cuts to programs that benefit low-income Americans. And we felt, along with a number of other church bodies and faith based organizations, that this was a real moral test of the church, that we had to come together and advocate with and for the poor, and had some real success in building a coalition that did a lot of advocacy on Capitol Hill, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, forming a circle of protection of the budget around programs that benefit low income Americans. And we're actually able to convince Congress to exclude cuts to those programs from the budget negotiations and the deal that was made in 2010. So how have you, uh, in the UK, what we quite often get is people are very, very quick to engage in activity at local level mm -hmm. and to do things. Yeah. There's a lot of activity, a lot of social action. But how have you managed to get churches to take that extra step into sort of prophetic advocacy and the work of addressing structures and social justice as, a, as an issue itself? It's a good question. I mean, part of it is engaging Christians at the point of their theology. I think part of what we've tried to do is really emphasize that a biblical understanding of justice requires that we get underneath root causes. It is important to meet immediate needs, and certainly compassion and charity is a major expression of living out our faith. But that's different than biblical justice. Biblical justice requires restoring right relationships between people, and it requires addressing some of the systemic and structural issues that are underneath people's pain and their, their struggle. And so what we've been successful in doing is helping to equip churches with the tools to be effective in advocacy and to try to convince them that advocacy is not kind of an add-on to faith, it's not an extracurricular activity. It literally is part and parcel of Christian discipleship. And that to follow Christ means to also be an advocate, particularly for the vulnerable and the marginalized, uh, very much following in the tradition of the biblical prophets. So we've developed kind of tools and resources for churches that both try to help them understand the biblical call to justice, but also try to give them practical ways that they can engage. I think the other thing that's important is to recognize that there are right ways and wrong ways for the church to engage in advocacy. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King had a quote that I think really is instructive in terms of this. He said, the church at its best is not called to be the servant or the master of the state, but to be the conscience of the state. And the church makes a mistake when it tries to take over the political system or a political party and become the master of the state. Because often in the process, it ends up just becoming the servant of the state. Yeah. I think what we do best is being the conscience of the state. Mm -hmm. And that means holding all political parties accountable to our biblical priorities, particularly our concern for the weak and vulnerable, which is just an overriding mm -hmm. theme in the Bible. What do you think we've got to learn from this work that we've been doing in the US and the UK? Mm -hmm. Difficult question. I yeah, think. no, certainly. And, and you know, there, there are certainly differences between the US and the UK. <laughs> Um, but I think there are some, some parallels and some lessons that can be learned. So one of the things we did really well 
was tried to unite the church around some core principles. So most churches, maybe not all, but the vast majority, will agree that we as Christians should have a particular concern for the poor, and that the moral test of our society is how the poor are being treated. And so while there may be disagreements about policies and which policies are best suited to address poverty, even getting to that first order priority that we should be prioritizing things that benefit the poor is a really important starting place. Because at least in the U.S. context, and I would imagine this is somewhat similar to the U.K. context, you know, the poor don't have a lot of political influence or power. They don't but have the best time. Yeah. So, yes. Um, and unfortunately, you know, politicians don't tend to prioritize the poor in their decision making. Uh, they don't necessarily have the same kind of political action committees that, that are quite influential in the United States, for example. So we really feel like the church is meant to stand in that gap and be that advocate for the voiceless, or at least for those that don't have as strong of a voice in the political system. But what, so that was kind of the first thing. The second thing that we did that was, was successful is build a really big tent around this kind of shared commitment and conviction. So it's been really important that the Catholic Conference of Bishops and the National Association of Evangelicals and the National Council of Churches and the Salvation Army and the you know, list goes on are all united in this broad coalition. And so it shows that we can agree to disagree on some things, but again, that we share this commitment to protect the poor in budget negotiations and policy-making decisions. And it's granted us a significant degree of policy access with both Republicans and Democrats. And it's given some of these politicians political cover because they can point to this very broad coalition that kind of spans both the left and the right and are able to show that there's a really deep and broad degree of support for these, these kind of policies and these kind of commitments. Um, the last thing that I would emphasize is that we have done a really good job of marshalling evidence. Unfortunately, the poor too often get trapped in the debate about poverty. Mm. And you know, while, again, there's disagreements about what is most effective or what works best, we've got to point to the best evidence that shows what's had the biggest impact. Mm. And, and be disciplined by that, because sometimes the evidence may point in a, a direction that's a little bit different than where your ideological preference may lean. But we've had some real success in being able to, to work with really credible think tanks and research institutions and be able to point to some of the evidence that they are generating to show what really works and what doesn't work, and then to kind of be guided by that. I mean, that's really helpful in our context because I think here in the UK things are changing and there is more of an opportunity now for a voice to be heard about the church speaking into that public space. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, fragile space, but I think there is a real opportunity for people with conscience and with with a, a commitment to those social justice issues to really be heard if we can unify to some degree some of the voice. So I look forward to today and what we might achieve through that. So thank you very much, Adam. Yeah, thank you. Excited what God has in store.